Hi everyone, I hope you're enjoying this sunny day. Um, got a question to answer today. It's from someone called 1B and they want to know have I ever read a book from a guy called Zachary Swan called um, Snowblind. Well, the answer to the question is no, I haven't actually read that book, but I have heard about it. And strangely enough, the um, person that told me about it, I was writing uh, my memoirs in prison and it was a long process. And uh, I'd part of that draft was, you know, some of the smuggling techniques that had been used. And um, yeah, one in particular, uh, the guy was helping me look, look through editing of it and he come across something I'd written, you know, one of the methods and techniques we used to use. And he said, this is something uh, that particular gentleman used to use um, back in the 70s. So that was interesting. And that particular uh, technique was actually suitcases. What we used to do was um, get hard back suitcases. Samson like, used to make the best ones. And um, what we'd do is we'd pack those uh, full of uh, marijuana. So literally you couldn't get another, you know, square millimeter um, of space in there. And uh, what we did do, they were, they were combination um, cases. So we used to have obviously someone at the airport and uh, what they would do is they would check on that a particular suitcase and also an identical one which would come with a passenger so the passenger basically he would have you know his clothes in a suitcase and he would board the plane and a second case identical to his actual case would be put on there but of course the combinations were different so what would inevitably happen is um, if he or when he actually arrived at the destination which was usually Heathrow or Gatwick um, if he picked up his suitcase and he walked through, well, that was happy days. But um, if by chance the customs officer pulled him aside, um, and obviously the process, to explain the process, what would happen is we'd have the suitcase, which would be full with contraband, would have a scratch along the side of it. And uh, when he went to the curacao to pick up his, um, his uh, luggage, he would clearly pick that particular suitcase up. And then obviously when he was walking through customs through the green light, if he did get pulled, first thing they would say to him is then straight away, you know, um, can you open your suitcase please, sir? And traditionally he would then, you know, say to them, this is the combination. Of course, that combination wouldn't open the um, suitcase. Then they would obviously, you know, wedge it open and to discover the um, case is full, you know, jam packed with weed. In which case that person would get arrested um, and then be interviewed and of course in his interview he would turn and say there's absolutely nothing about it he's just coming back from his holiday and there's no idea whatsoever how that case you know got on there and uh, obviously they would you know did completely say that he's a bang at it and obviously knows exactly the case was full of drugs but then what would happen is they would have to go back to the curacao and then they would find a piece of luggage um, going around the curacao and of course it would be an identical suitcase in which case they would bring the suitcase back and um, then he would then look at them and they would look at him and then he would say that's his suitcase and of course he would then give them the magic combination they would open up the suitcase and it would be his dirty laundry um, from the holiday in that suitcase and pretty much there was absolutely nothing whatsoever they could do but um, release him so that was a method we used to use that was I think back in the 90s um, that was used quite a lot um, so listen, I'm not giving you guys ideas for smuggling, I hope I'm not, because it's a, you know, a very uh, dangerous track that will lead, as I said, um, only one way, and that's going to be in prison, or it could be another way you could not get yourself killed. But the death and destruction you're going to cause to others, as I said, isn't worth it for any amount of money. Um, so that's your answer to your question today. Um, got a whole bunch of questions here from FD McIntyre. I wonder if you're related to Donald, one of my trustees. Um, okay, so as I'm sitting, waiting, trying to get my car washed, I'm gonna um, try to answer them as many as I possibly can. So um, yeah, starting with the first one, um, school. I left school um, probably about 15 and stuff. I just, just I stopped going. Um, so I left with no qualifications, not even a 10 yard swimming certificate. Um, and street savvy, yeah, I feel I've got quite a lot of street savvy um, and that's what kind of got me through. Um, I enjoyed working, you know, I've always enjoyed working, especially for myself. 
I've never really had a conventional job, you know, I would help my dad and obviously worked in my parents' business and off license and uh, that was always, you know, a filler. And um, I always had my own business, you know, first starting with a sound system and then, you know, worked my way through. Over the years, I probably had maybe over a hundred um, businesses, companies, all different sorts of, you know, stuff, ranging from a whole raiment of things. Um, spiritual, am I spiritual? Yes, I'm very spiritual, believe it or not. Um, I believe, you know, you have to let your conscience be your guide, that's really important. But more importantly, I think it's really important to understand that there's greater uh, things out there than us. Um, so, and I know that because the amount of things I've kind of, you know, got away with over the years and um, still alive and, you know, could have been in prison for a lot longer. Um, so, yeah, I believe you do find a guide. I think you have to do things, even if you've done bad things, you have still have to have a little bit of uh, mercy and compassion in you, you know. Um, at Jamaica, beautiful place, it's my spiritual home. And, you know, so many amazing places there, especially, you know, on the north coast, on the south coast. The grill is one of my favorite places. Um, the sun rises and sets there amazing place and it rains every day just to give a beautiful you know um, rainfall to make the place nice and cool St Elizabeth it's on the south coast of the island untouched almost um, north coast lots of tourists uh, activity but again beautiful beaches and wonderful settings you know great place to wake up to every day and uh, you know eat from the land rip from the land you know wonderful people everyone's got a smile on their face that part of Jamaica certainly you know um, yeah hopefully that answers some of your questions and uh, just keep the questions coming and I'll keep answering them um, FMG's asked me an interesting questions uh, where was the best rave sites well that's tricky really um, I think for Genesis uh, we had some great venues and we were a real warehouse um, organization even though we did um, actually Put an event in a field with biology um, towards the end of our sort of reign. But um, in terms of the best venues, I think, in my opinion, it was Leeside Road in um, East London. Um, yeah, and also actually, um, I think um, Ferry Lane, Ferry Lane probably, yeah, would have topped that. And strangely enough, Ferry Lane ne never really, it, ne it nearly never happened. Um, I remember uh, we found a warehouse, it was amazing and it had no electricity in it and we were kind of in a jam we were leaving it till the last minute and i went out that friday night and i went to the way club um we had a, a taxi service kind of thing that we used to use for our events there a guy called jerry and his partner wd and uh w basically he was an electrician and lucky enough he was dropping me back home from the wag and i wanted to go and check on the warehouse i drove him past there and realized that we see there was no electricity in there and he said look you know we can get it fixed the breaker box was completely broken so uh he spent the next well i did as well the next sort of four hours imagine that coming out of a club sort of in the middle of the night you know like four in the morning and you're tired you're knackered you have been up all night and you actually then driving around um to electrical shops for them to open when they open at seven o'clock or eight o'clock in the morning um and literally you know um standing over this guy while he repairs everything puts brake boxes in place the whole nine yards so as we could have a party that night and that was it after that uh ferry lane i think was one of our best party events a lot of people say that all the time to me um so that i guess was a, a great site especially if people were coming out in the morning because it was set beside a lake and uh, there was lots of barges you know um, laid along the side of it and people used to come out obviously and um, you know they'd be hit by the sun and the water great um, atmosphere so i hope that answers your question